Welcome everyone to SAM 161, the David Copperfield is really here assembly. We are in Las Vegas in his amazing museum and we're just over the moon that he's here taking time out for us. David, thank you so much for being here. Um, let's start, we'll talk about SAM 161 in a few minutes, but first let's talk about growing up in Metuchen, New Jersey. So tell us a few memories about what it was like being a kid and your days. Back. You know, they say, you know, one of my classmates say, I remember you in the hallway, you know, doing card tricks. And I don't remember that at all. You know, I was kind of, uh, I was doing magic as art at the time. You know, I was just, Jeff Sheridan was the, the big deal at the time. And just the technique of how to do this, using fans and uh, back palming and so forth. That was kind of my thing. And maybe that's what they're talking about, that I was walking around doing that kind of, that kind of thing. But uh, it was, it was great. You know, it was like living in Mayberry, but New York was an hour away. So I had this kind of this country, everyone, everybody in the town, but literally one hour on the bus or 45 minutes, 50 minutes, you could be in tannins, you know, you could really, it was amazing. Yeah. And I did that, you know, practically every day, uh, go to school and boom, right to New York. At what age did you first go into New York? Uh, about 12 years old. 12 years old, okay. But before that, you got into ventriloquism. Yeah. What inspired you to do ventriloquism? Paul Winchell, Paul Winchell's. Paul Winchell, Winchell Mahoney show? Yeah, Winchell Mahoney time and Paul Winchell guest shots that he did. Just that he was a genius, you know, he was a troubled genius, but a genius, you know, invented the artificial heart, right? You know, the voice of Tigger, uh, right. yeah, he, uh, disposable razors, all his invention. <laughs> artificial heart invention <laughs> and disposable razors. So he was brilliant, a brilliant performer, actor, uh, amazing. And, you know, I started emulating him and I got attention from people. People liked me in school, they liked me. I said, well, maybe I should do this job. I, I know I wasn't very good, but the idea of getting up there and telling jokes and you know having a, a figure, a friend that I could you know could relate to me, could behave, you know, it was, it was a good deal. And did you did you um, learn from books or how did you learn the ventriloquism technique? I learned horribly. You know, I had of course <laughs> the the book uh, Winch's book was uh, ventriloquism, ventriloquism, ventriloquism for Since fun and say. for fun and profit. Okay. Uh, which was, uh, you know, I think it was a pretty interesting title for fun and profit. <laughs> um, but, you know, they show the tongue position and so forth, uh, how to do it. But he was, he was so good. You know, you make your best. You try. I had, you mentioned before you have the record. I had some records to, to teach. And I didn't have the, the uh, Danny O'Day, Jimmy Nelson, uh, Jimmy Nelson Danny O'Day uh, record. But I think, you know, you did everything you could. And my act was out of the back of Boys Life magazine. Boys Life had, right. I was a Cub Scout and uh, the back of their jokes from the back of Boys Life magazine. So I use that as my act. Can you remember one of the jokes? It's horrible, it's horrible. I, you know, I can't do it anyway, but it's like, uh, my, you know, my mother had a mud pack treatment. Really good, how does she look? Fine, until she took the mud off. <laughs> That's why I do magic. Wait, yes, wait for the laugh, okay. Um, all right, so here's a question. You did ventriloquism as a kid, and now, in your show, not to give away too much, but there's an alien that appears. His name is Blue. So essentially, it's kind of the same idea. But less talent. My talent was invention talent. <laughs> it's all recorded. The voice is very recorded. Okay. But, but the inspiration was two-person comedy was new. I had never done it except for that when I was doing ventriloquism. So that idea was a very kind of a thing I didn't conquer, really. And um, it really goes back to Topo Gigio. Right, Ed Sullivan show. Yeah, so right. having a little character that would be animated, and, you know, something really cute and adorable, and having that relationship. They only did a three-minute thing. I'm doing a thirty-minute thing, so mm -hmm. it's a little bit more challenging. So I pushed, pushed the envelope a little bit for that. But do you think, as a ten or twelve-year-old kid doing ventriloquism, you were a genius having this vision of the future? Not a genius, but I think the idea of finding things that you have to complete in your life. You know, I loved animatronics. I loved. Uh, all of uh, the stuff I saw at the New York World's Fair at 64 and 65. I was seeing this amazing animatronics and Lincoln, and, you know, animated puppetry, you know, to, to do really, to, what can I do with that to make that even better than what was done before? And so, you know, the puppet is a long, long time of using magic principles and animatronic principles that appears, disappears, that all, it's really, really quite good. Side thing, you mentioned the World's Fair. Do you remember going to the magic show at the, the cigar um, pavilion? We have a display downstairs of that uh, general cigar okay. uh, thing, which was Mark Wilson's work. You know, yeah. originally had this gigantic thing that never, never happened. The uh, sin illusion they had with 
with uh, projections and so forth. And they, you know, sold this big thing and they, they couldn't deliver it on time. So they did um, basically a magic show with a thin model sawing and uh, like a, 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 what's it called? A, a Indian chief, he could never do this today. Uh, mm -hmm. a, 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 you know, a store, cigar store Indian that turns into a, you know, uh, a woman or a right. man. I forget, they did levitations, Osiris and so forth. And it was amazing. And we have the hand machine downstairs from that thing. They, they demonstrated the, uh, the, oh, the general cigars, which is the, the, the pavilion that uh, Mark Wilson had. I remember going and it was Mark Wilson's voice yeah. who did the narration. And I said, it's the guy, it's that guy. I didn't know his name, but it was, yeah. I was thrilled, yeah. but it wasn't him. No, it was James did, Randi. It was right? uh, uh, Pam Thompson was in that show. Is that right? Uh, many okay. people uh, you know, played magicians in Co Norton, I think. Did that show. Was Kmart in the store? I don't, I, I don't know. That would be a discounted cigar. <laughs> okay. So talk to us now about getting into um, the Society of American Magicians. You first went to the uh, Parent Assembly in New York, right? And they sneaked you in, is that correct? Well, Ed Michelle befriended me, you know, when I was a kid. Ed Michelle, the artist. The artist and the magician. Right. Uh, and uh, when other guys were like turning their back on me and practicing their Buckley counts and Biddle counts and stuff, and let me see, Ed Michelle was very welcoming to me. So it was kind of a special person. And we kind of hung out. We go to lunch and so forth. And he really befriended me. And he was the guy who did all the illustrations for, for all the you know things that we dream about. You know, sitting in the toilet watching all this, uh, all the stuff on in the Italian catalog. He right. did those drawings. Wow. So he did my business card. Uh, he befriended me. And he used to sneak sneak me in. Him and Leslie Guest, Leslie P. Guest, uh, was. Um, was sneaking in, you know, promised. He said, you better say M-U-M. -M. Don't say mum the magazine. Okay. It's not mum, it's M-U-M. -M. Magic, you need my blessed guest. And he was, you know, uh, really up, up, up in years, but still really vital and really like, you know, uh, doing his stuff. And, and it was great. Jerry, you know, Jerry Oppenheimer and his daughter, Janet Oppenheimer, who still, I still tell people that I was so jealous of Janet Oppenheimer because she got all the attention because she was a young, beautiful girl. Uh, at the time, doing the dancing cane. I said, well, I do the dancing cane too. But uh, I think she may have done it better than me. I think. But anyway, well, all those guys in, the, in, in that, that uh, uh, you know, assembly were really fun. Who do I remember? I remember Joe Barnett. Of course, Mr. Schindler is on with us today. You know, wonderful, wonderful magician. Um, who else was there? There was Larry R. Curie. And uh, God, um, it was, it, was, it was a great, great time. Amy Lowe. And I was a 12 year old kid. Did, were the things you did to them, for them, that they were like, wow, that's pretty good. And let's work on this and try that. And you might... it, I was really just trying to a sponge, kind of seeing what the value of different things were, trying to study what, what was up. And it was, a, it was always in a different, they moved around a bit at that time. It was a church here, a temple here, and, you know, uh, but someone looking forward to it, they had really interesting lectures. Jose de la Torre would come and do a lecture. And Magic Christian, who was my friend today, would come in. Uh, flip Halema, doing the flip stick. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those lectures are really something to look forward to because they bring the people in from uh, Europe and so forth. And, and uh, they have something new. It was cool. And how about some of these guys from SAM 161? Um, you want to take a look at those names and talk well, to us about These them? are guys that I know from... Ring 200. Oh, the IBM ring. Okay. In, in New Jersey. Okay. In, IBM in New York was Ring 26, I think. Okay. And that was, oh God, uh, Claire Manley and, oh God, this is the other woman who did the flying carpet. Uh, Schindler would know immediately, of course. Let unleash Schindler. I need, I need his help. Is, can we unleash? George, George Schindler, are you there? George, unmute yourself. David has a question. Are you thinking of Velma? Velma. 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 Somebody else too. Velma. Maybe it was Velma on the flying carpet. Uh, that was it. That was her whole act sitting on the flying carpet. Oh. Actually, still has the flying carpet. She's trying to sell it. You want to buy one? Probably. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. No, but um, but in that ring, well, actually, in the ring two hundred in New York is where was where my house was nearby, and Jim Angelo was my friend. You know, he was kind of just starting to do mentalism at the time. And Carl Bajer started doing conventions, kind of doing Larry Weeks kind of conventions at the right, time. Right. Larry Weeks is another, you know, amazing character that, you know, you go into to New York and you'd, you'd uh, 
you go to the one day conventions that Larry Weeks, Larry Weeks held. And what was the Edison Hotel? Where was Larry Weeks conventions at? Five bucks. How much was it? I mean, where was it? In Edison Hotel, I think, was uh, in where they, the magic circle has been meeting. It was just great. And I learned about Sherm's from Larry Weeks, you know, and he was amazing, amazing conventions that they had. Tell us what Sherm's is. A manufacturer who I knew nothing about, you know, I was a tannins guy, but I didn't know what Sherm's was. Now I have Sherm's uh, the, uh, the box that you cut the person in half. What's that called downstairs? It's really great. Um, somebody help me. Anyway, <laughs> the point is, it was it was a great great time at that time. And, and who was a, a Carl Bajer, uh, Farvel the Marvel, it was awesome. Al Hillman. Did you go to the round table, the um, John McNicholas round table? A little bit, a little bit. Okay. But I went to all the, you know, the, the meetings, the lunches they have at the governor's and at the, at the Edison Hotel. And, you know, that after Saturday, after Tans closed, you go to that stuff. And it was just fantastic. Was I remember one phone call for the round table, and you were talking to Carl, Carl Bajer. You were mentioning eating cookies in his kitchen. Yeah. So that was just. Uh, I did. I must have. Hanging out yeah. when you're a kid. Yeah, that's good. Um, can you tell us a story? You've told us before about going to New York and buying the temple screens. Yeah. I'm sorry if it's no, a it's tough a, memory. It's, no, it's, it's a, you know, when you're a kid and you have the Panic catalog, you go through it and you find things you dream about. You dream for months before you save up the quarters and the nickels and the dollars get enough money to get something right. and that money's burning a hole in your pocket and i went to tannins i dreamed of getting the temple screens and my house my mother had all this chinese um, asian uh, furniture and that kind of thing so all the screens you buy were not that expensive but they were marquetry uh, you know uh, ivory pieces and, and uh, pieces of brass hinges and so forth and it was like that's what i thought it was going to be, <laughs> and I went to ten, saved the money. I put the put the money on the table, and my mother says, "Me and my mother." This is the the real Tans. Tans is great today, fantastic. They're doing a great job, but my memory is the real one, which is Forty Second Street, the World Star Building, Thirteenth Floor. It was called the Fourteenth Floor, I think. Um, and um, he said, "I want to buy the Temple screen." I'm expecting to pull up this beautifully, you know, wood inlaid thing. <laughs> and Irv pulls out the screens and shows me how it works. I see it's made with staples and <laughs> gaffer's tape and spray painted, spray painted, um, you know, Buddhas on it and so forth. And I learned the method of it and my, I'm starting to sweat, you know. And you're how old? Eight, nine? About nine years okay. old. So my dream was like <clears throat> crushed because I'm watching this thing and the method, it's staple. Well, I have staples at home. <laughs> <laughs> I have tape at home and I can spray paint stuff. That's like, what is that? And I didn't know what to do. So I looked over his shoulder. And there was a sign behind him that said, uh, once you know the secret, you can't return. You can't return this stuff because you know the secret. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. so once the secret's taught, the, the prop is bought. Who knows? Right. So they put it in a plastic bag and we go down the elevator into I think Bryant Park. It was you and your mom. Me and my mom. And mom looks at me and I, I'm crying. I'm crying. I said, what's wrong with you? Why are you crying? I said, well, it's cardboard and it's tape and the things that I know. And I know the method. And now if you know the method, the secret, you know, you can't return it. And I was, oh God. She takes me, pulls me back. We go up the elevator. She puts it on the counter in front of her. It says, he doesn't like it. <laughs> what else can you do? I said, well, for $3 more, you can have this. Pull out an appearing king. It's like a James Bond thing. You can't make that at home. It's not cardboard. <laughs> no. It was a metal German appearing king. Fantastic thing. Three bucks more, I think it was. I was a happy guy. So, pretty sad yeah. story. <laughs> well. And then later on, you get to be an adult yeah. and you watch people do tablet screens really well mm -hmm. and you realize it's a really good effect. It really is good. Yeah. You know? made out of cardboard and tape and stuff but you know i didn't understand it at the time and you know you have to as you get older you realize this quality uh, of of effects when the, sometimes the, the technology is not the, the best 
And when, when you did get the appearing cane, had you seen that before in the catalog and had maybe, oh, maybe on your it was, too, it, was, it was too expensive. It's too expensive. Yeah, yeah, three bucks more. You know, it's like uh, dream big and that kind of stuff. I mean, right now when I do my tannin tour, I do the uh, Abbott Batania, the one that's just like this. And every time I do that, I just, I was a kid and I had that. Life, would be, all the problems of life would be solved. <laughs> I mean, this, <laughs> this thing, and now I have a couple of them. You know? And it's like, I demonstrate, I say, yeah, that is pretty cool. Yeah, and for those who don't know, it's just the flowers appear instantly. But it's beautifully, it's beautifully yeah. made and so forth. And, you know, yeah. and yeah. Very funny. Very and before funny. tannins, you know, Mayor yeah. out there, I'll give a plug, yeah. is now going to be selling the board that Danny Chiklis uh, sold at Macy's. So before tannins, he was going to Macy's because I went, I took my ventriloquist thought and wanted, I want a better dummy. I want a better, you know, figure. Maybe Macy's has a better dummy. And I walked in there and Danny Chiklis had this counter and he demonstrated the the, the board, the vanishing coin on the board. Uh, this was called the Xylo board. Mary, what are you calling it now? Who's going to, what, what's it called now? Mayor? Uh, Danny's panel board. Panel board? What? Danny's panel board. So, you're so Mayor spent a lot of time compiling a, a teach tape of how to, to, uh, to really handle this thing. And when you watch Danny Chiklos do this thing, it's like, it's as good as it gets. You know, the, the vanishes are amazing because his technique was good. Mayor's kind of decoded, kind of simplified it in a way that you can get, get to that look and that feeling. But that really changed me, you know, back this is before Tannins. And then that, you know, went to Tannins. Uh, that idea brought me to Tannins. Yeah. And Danny did it so well because he did it so many times, right? I think both. <laughs> do, do it so many times, certainly, you know, my, my lesson in life is passion, preparation, persistence. You know, it's like you have to be passionate about something, you really prepare, and then you're persistent about it. Right. And the persistence, he had the persistence, he did it millions of times, literally millions of times to feed his family over right. the years. And even when later in his life, when he really, his faculties weren't all there, he could do that board. And it's like, and that's the, the movie that, that David Haversat shot. Um, and uh, it's, in a, it's a real miracle, you know. So Mayor, you check that out. Mayor's doing a great job with that. Yeah, he's debuting it at uh, Magic Live. So we're looking forward to that. That's next week. Um, well, let's go to a different thing. Uh, totally different question. All right, so you were performing, you did shows, you did television specials. Now you had the look, you still have the look. You had the poise, you had the personality, you had the movements, the, 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 the comedy, the humor, the voice. Now, what if, just say, you didn't have the voice. Let's say you had Al Flosso's voice. <laughs> would you still become David Copperfield? I would have been better. You would have been better. That's right. <laughs> My assistants would be beating the shit out of him. But, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, no, Al was great. I have his whole act downstairs, right. you know, with the film playing, with the stuff there. You know, there's an you example. Mean the dream or? Uh, everything. Okay. Everything. It's everything. It's the clocks and the... the uh, my, my dream, all the flowers, everything. Down there. And you still see that and you see the film of him doing it. I think it was on the uh, Magic Ranch, Don Allen's Magic Ranch performance. Okay. But he was great. I mean, he was great. I mean, there's many, many acts that are great that have done, you know, he did that 10 minute thing, whatever the time was. Mm -hmm. He did a puppet act. That's it. We're done. You know, but it was great. Right. You know what I'm saying? And uh, same thing with Marvin Royce and Shining Pollock, that little thing. You know, mm -hmm. uh, not a little thing, big thing, but it was that. Thing he did really great. Right. Um, I think uh, you know it would have it would have been a different career. You know, if I, well, I say you know, stand up straight, my boy, stand up straight. All right, you know, it's pretty good. Okay. <laughs> it's a pretty good. I'm album. from New York. <laughs> Those who don't know, that's a pretty good Al Flosso. Um, when you do your shows live, you uh, interact with the audience. Are you, are you having people come on stage yet, or is this still now they're back to coming on stage? Okay, and you have people from all over the world speaking different languages. And you're able to have a few phrases or words to throw out at them. Um, can you speak any of those languages? I'm kind of like Wayne Newton. Like Wayne Newton. Wayne Newton, his act, he does, he plays every instrument. You know, okay. Why are you all? My guy's playing every instrument. Right. He knows two, three notes of the, of the four notes of this, okay. of the thing. Okay. And that's like me. I know limited I'm, languages, not my forte right. at all. Um, and, um, I've done 10 world tours, 10 times around the world. 
it's a lot. It's a lot. And um, in their country, I speak really good their language because I have a translator. I've got the words phonetically all over the stage. I don't memorize them at all. I look down there and I miss. I kind of like Charo. Do you know what Charo is? Sure, Coochie Coochie. So why is, why was that? Why would be like Charo? Why would you be like Charo? Not, not you, my body. You, you say, I think of what I want to say is the thing that I want to say because she was. Really just, yeah. I got lots of Charo. It's perfect. <laughs> there we go. Just get you in a dress. We're going on the road. I don't know about that. So the talk. <laughs> the point is that that what Charo did is she mess up all the words. She was a malaprop. It was pretty much a malaprop act, right. like uh, Norm Crosby. And right. when I go into the country, I'd say the box would be kaka. I would say kaka. Right. You know, I would say it, I have all these things. And I'd go to S South America and I'd find out the name of the store. It was the cheapest kind of, worse than Kmart kind of store. Mm -hmm. It would be gigante, gigante, gigante. Right. So I'd borrow a tie from the audience and I'd look at the home, oh, expensive, gigante. Three minutes of laughter. <laughs> anyway, they took, they, I took the time to learn the you know, gigante. Right. Uh, so it's like you find these moments of what to do. And I somehow remember enough in this show. If I have a person yesterday, we had oh, somebody from India. And a key in India. What was it yesterday? At, at the moment, I would remember it. Yeah. yeah. I'm not remembering enough. But, uh, uh, and I remember what it was. And, and uh, do the, the mock is another thing, and somehow it strikes you at the moment you, get, you come you bring it back. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I get through it enough, and I know the language is very bad, but I fake it good. Yes. I remember seeing you in Japan, and you said "kampakina nihongo." You know what that means? It means "kampaki na nihongo." So that would be uh, this. Yeah, you remember that? Where were you in Japan? I was a teacher. I taught uh, English to high school kids. So yeah. Yeah, but, but but people will laugh because we, you're off a little bit, but you're trying to say that you speak perfect Japanese. Kampaki ni nihongo. So nihongo is the language is Japanese. Japanese, right? Kampaki ni is perfect Japanese. Kampaki. I thought it was kapakina. I don't know. <laughs> you're a teacher. <laughs> I taught English, not Japanese. Yeah, kampaki ni nihongo. Right. And, and of all the countries you went to and you attend tours, are there, are there any special ones that you would like to go back to or you miss or? Or did you like them all for different reasons? Or? Pretty much, that's a good, safe answer. You know, in, oh, in South, South America, the jokes worked every time. Jokes worked. In Germany, guaranteed, no problem. They just think, you know, uh, France, a little bit more, you know, a little more, you know, particular, let's put it that right. way. And, uh, but I figured out how to do it, though. It was like a challenge when it didn't really work as well as a neighboring country. I just really go home kind of pissed off. And I figured, what can I change or do to make it work? In French, that good, you know, and uh, yeah, I mean, we survived in, in Japan, China, you know, audiences are really different, you know, but they are, we are all alike, you know, in this wonder thing that that need to, to be uh, transported. We are, we do all share that as human beings. Yeah, and so much of your stuff translates because it's visual. You can and you can tell the story with the visual effects. And, and you know, when you go to Japan. You know, all the people from Kenya will come to the show. All of them, brilliant. I think these brilliant inventors. Mm -hmm. And they'll present to me all the, their new stuff that nobody's ever seen. You know, I mean, you know, it's an honor to, to, to see all their new stuff. And all they do is keep trying to craft new new ideas, new technology. And I love it. I do the same thing. So, Yeah, I've seen you at Magic Live. And walk, you always walk around the dealer's room. And I've seen you buy a few things. Yeah. And is that the reason, just because they appeal to you? Or I mean, are there things that you perform or you just like the method or a little bit of everything? It's being a kid again, you know, mostly I never, never would use it. Um, there's a few things that have inspired other things, the application of principles in a different way. Usually what's in my show, you won't recognize from the dealer's room, usually. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. You don't see anything in my show that, like that. But, but I've usually twisted it up enough or redone it, but there's be something that also, There'll be a deal that I like, you know, that they'll they'll have a kind of a a pitch that I like. And, oh, yeah, I'm going for it. You know, it's like, you know, that thing is just kind of fun. And you do, I'm guilty, like every magician does. You have it, you play with it, and you put it in the drawer, you know. But it was a, a fun moment. You live those kind of moments uh, like that. And then I got to get back to work of something, creating something really new, and really fresh. Right. Did you ever buy something at Magic Live and you went back home and started to cry? Because you just did not. <laughs> You felt like it was so stupid. No, I, 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 no, no. It was I mean, made it was with funny. staples. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, 
No, I have bought things that don't work after a couple of tries. Uh, yeah, it's it, you know, it's great. You know, going to Magic Live, I can't go very much this time because I'm going out of the country. But right. for one day, I'll do, do a dealer's room sweep. And you know, this magicians should be very proud because in that room, or the two rooms, whatever it is that particular year, there's really creative energy that's really just great. And I'm very proud to be a magician because I see the work that someone will take to get things as right as they can get it, you know? And it's uh, how we have to think uh, should be championed. You know, it's really, really good. And I, I'm very proud of this craft when there's new things created. All right, different uh, topic here. Orson Welles, Cary Grant, tell us a little bit about your experience with them. They were lovers. They were lovers. <laughs> they were not lovers. I'm joking. Why do you put them both together? They're just two names that are I'm fans of, and uh, I, they don't have to be together. Just uh... well, Cary Grant um, gave me one of the Magic Castle Awards. That was pretty amazing. Right, you're on the cover of Genie, I think. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, but you know, um, not my best moment visually, but <laughs> compared to Cary Grant, you know, it's Cary Grant. Uh, but did you spend I'm, time with him, or did you, was it just that I, one? Not enough. I mean, he was a member of the Magic Castle. He was that. But I spent time with him in the movie theater. Oh, gosh. Yeah. North by Northwest, the front, mm. front page, his girl Friday, you know, uh, right. the, uh, just watch Bring, Bringing Up Baby. <laughs> it's just it's great. It's he's, timing is he's, amazing. He's, just a, he's a star in every possible way. Amazing, amazing, amazing stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. And Norris and I spent lots of time. You know, he did one, my first special, my second right. special, one of the first thing, and kind of. He was a tough one, tough one to, to, to work with, the crew and so forth. Um, and he kind of. Was he more of a perfectionist? Um, is that, did that slow call, things down? No, it wouldn't be that. It would be. He had a vision. He respected his audience. His audience of people, like, were certain so much. They, he was like 10 times smarter than all of them. But for some reason, the convention of being on stage and being your humble servant, he made it feel real. You know, it was amazing. Uh, he uh, was very demanding, but you can talk to Kaveny about it. He, the whole thing he did on the Tonight Show, which is downstairs, uh, the speech he gave about it. All his magician speeches are usually pretty hokey. <laughs> From the greatest, you know, mountain in the Himalayas, it's like really bad. <laughs> Orson doing the same thing. It's like a masterpiece, just because how he did it. You know, Shakespearean actor. You know, all the magicians that do that kind of stuff, Orson doing it, it's really inspiring. Um, and he had, there's a moment in there where it's a throne chair and he pulled the cloth up and the girl's legs would appear from beneath the cloth first, boom, boom, like this before the things over. I asked Kate and he said, who, who gave him that idea? He said, that's totally, totally Orson. Totally Orson. So, no. so he really understood that thing. If you watch the tape of him doing uh, the Mercury Wonder show with uh, Marlena Dietrich and all the stuff, and his moves and what he does, it's pretty good. You know, he really was, you know, he wanted to be respected as a magician and he should be respected because when he did it at the right moments, certain times on the Tonight Show wasn't reversed, mm -hmm. wasn't perfection. So it mm -hmm. was kind of, you know, winged it a bit, but the McCabeny experience was not winged and um, my experience was not winged, uh, but uh, he realized in my, sh my show that he was really, grating on the crew's nerves a bit. Oh. And he went into the dressing room, he stands says, kind of to repay them for this, or pay me for that. He said, put a camera on me, put a spot, follow spot like this, one backlight, one follow spot like this, I'm gonna do something. And he walks on stage and he gives the opening of my special, where he introduces me. So you can watch it on YouTube. Literally, from the top of his head, just brilliant. He, wow. was, he was a genius. A genius in many, many ways. He had his demons, genius. And uh, he gave that speech. And that just kind of set the stage for every special I did afterwards. We always had the which Andy, Andy Dickinson or Jason Robards doing that speech with Basin Orson going, let me do something. And he walks into does this thing. And like he says all these nice things about me. And he kind of he liked me. He liked my work. Hmm. And I, you know, I'm sitting there in an audience watching you do this off the top of his head. 
And I ran to the stage, got on the floor, and I kissed his shoes. <laughs> and it was it was very nice. So he he was he was a very to me very very good guy, huge inspiration as yeah. a filmmaker. Yeah. As a level of a Citizen Kane, level of excellence, it's like still to this day. You go back and you watch it. You go, I got to do what I'm doing better. I do it better. I saw something in Citizen Kane recently that I didn't realize before. Rosebud's a sled? Huh? Rosebud's a sled? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, folks. <laughs> no, in the beginning, he, when the, the kid's being taken away, he says, oh, you're going to go to Chicago and New York and maybe Washington, D.C. And it didn't click with me but because he goes into politics, but he doesn't make it. And that line was not just written haphazardly. That was the, another haphazard. Thing. Yeah. And so I, that was one I, you know, I've seen it yeah. 20 times. And, um, is there one illusion you've always wanted to do, but you had to abandon it? And if so, are you still working on it? Um, there's a couple I'm still working on of that nature, but I did an illusion I thought was going to be great. It was called Make Your Own Magician. You get to pick Marilyn Monroe's body and Gumby's head and Clint Eastwood's <laughs> pants and all that. And you put these things, they sort of a motley man. I think it's called a motley man. Okay. Idea. And we built it. And it really was bad. You know, so I did a few performances. Yeah, it's in that warehouse somewhere. But uh, yeah, that wasn't great. Me singing is an illusion I can't do. <laughs> singing well, uh, that's something that doesn't work. Um, well, you sang in the in the, the show you did, but um, they cut your songs. Is that what they did? Most of them. Most, most of them. them. Okay. A wise choice. You probably do well at karaoke, right? Very, very good. Yeah. 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 You have a go-to song? Uh, yeah, I have a lot. What's I, one of your favorites? I write the songs. That <laughs> Barry Manilow. And, uh, yeah, I have uh, uh, "You're Nobody If Somebody Loves You" version of uh, B. Martin. I have uh, 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 the Rainbow Connection. This thing with my daughter is nice. So you cover the whole cover. family spectrum. Yeah, I do. Yeah. That's great. Where and a we... taxi, 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 which is uh, uh, what's his name? It was raining hard in Frisco. Oh, I thought you meant the theme song from the TV show. I can it's hum that. I can hum that. Or with a kazoo. <laughs> yes. Okay. So when can we see you appear in karaoke next? Uh, you you, you won't. <laughs> you won't. going to happen. Close family and friends. Right. 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 Who's, who's got a clock going? Do we know what time it is? A, um... It's 7.34. 7.34. Okay. Here's the thing. We're going to go about 10 more minutes. And David said we could do some questions and answers. So uh, think about that. And the other thing is afterwards, we're going to end um, at the hour, but I'm going to go outside and get back on my Zoom on the, my camera phone and just do a couple shots outside. So stay tuned for that. I can't promise you what time it'll be, but if you want to hang out, hang out for that. Um, when you went to France and someone handed you a piece of an illusion, that um, made you cry. It's in that safe right there. Where's the safe? Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, it was, yeah, pretty emotional. Uh, how, when was that? Years ago? 20 years ago. Okay, 20 years ago. Yeah. It was a George Proust and uh, Christian Fester handed me the, the gimmick, the harness for the ethereal levitation. Mm -hmm. yes, that's where we began. In fact, same reaction is this corner here that you're not going to see. This is the George Melies corner when uh, ah. Guillermo del Toro was here. He started to cry around these things. Wow. Yeah, same thing. It's like that's the beginning. That's what that started. Everything that didn't exist within his world, the film world, that started in my world. Um, you know, seeing that that harness is yeah, pretty amazing. No, I, I have it. Yeah. Yes. If you were to direct a film, what kind of film would you like to direct? A great one. A great one? Okay. Yeah. Um, real quick about SAM 161. And again, thank you for, here, here's the story. Jim Flood, who's out there somewhere, uh, wrote you a letter, the old style, you know, letter with a stamp, and asked you if you would let us use your name for our assembly. And that Saturday, his daughter picked up the phone, and it was you. She said, Dad, is David. David who? And, and Anyway, you said, yeah, sure. Oh, I'm honored. What are you talking about? Yeah, Personally. and we're honored. And um, and then shortly thereafter, you performed at the NJ Pack, yeah. and you were doing the flying illusion. You were touring. And it was almost the end of the show. You were just about to do flying, and we said, oh, I guess he's not going to say anything. <laughs> and then... I proved you, you wrong. <laughs> you said, I like to talk about some people. And you had a stand-up, 
And it was like we were on the Ed Sullivan show in the audience, you know, and um, it was a great you were moment. Carol Lawrence. Carol Lawrence. All right. Yes. <laughs> You're a Truman Cavody. <laughs> We've got references here. I hope everyone's getting these all. I think <laughs> look at this group. They know exactly what I'm talking about. Yes. Um, Richard Wiseman asked you, uh, Richard Wiseman, the great, by the way, your book, we're running out of time, but your book, The History of Magic by David book. Cobb, it's a great book and everyone should have it. It's an inexpensive book, but it should be worth, it should cost more, but it doesn't. Anyway. You have no excuses. You have no excuses. Anyway, um, fantastic book. Talks about this museum, but it's not about the museum, it's about the history and the shoulders of people you've, you've been on. Um, and he had Richard Wiseman, who co-wrote it with you, who has the great Quirkology website. Okay, it's really cool stuff. He said, what is your legacy? What do you want your legacy to be? Do you remember what you answered? You said you want to be the first 120-year-old magician. Now, let me, let me just be, put this on a personal thing with me. When I turned 60, I said, I'm only halfway done. That's good for you. So, so I think as long as our, our brains are working and our bodies are working, we can do that. So I think we should meet again like when we're 100. It. And we have a date. Know, maybe every 10 years. Um, passion, preparation, perseverance. What else uh, can passion, you? No, correct. What? Passion, preparation, perseverance. Is that what it said? Persistence. I don't know. You well, can use whatever you want. <laughs> you used to tour, you did 500 shows a year. Now you're doing 640 a year. Next I, year, 720. I don't even have a question for that. It's just. Is it just what you love? I have a good time. You know, if I did say, why don't you do one show a night? It wouldn't be the same. I just like doing it. And the audience is really there. We have fun. I mean, I've seen you yeah. always having fun. And it's, and it's because of the audience. You're playing off the audience, right? And there'll be different things. We had a guy who was totally drunk last night. Totally drunk. He's got a, a guards the letter, the ribbon around his neck. Right. And uh, I make a joke about it. He's like moving around. It's like really, really drunk. And uh, I said the F word in the show last night. Believe it or not, I said the F word. I couldn't believe it. People who won, you know, it was effed up. I said, yeah, you're in Vegas. It's okay to be effed up. You know, I'm saving your ears. For this. I put the thing around his neck, this thing, the ribbon, from to guard the thing. And I say, my normal thing is that you're, this is like the ending scene from Star Wars. You are Chewbacca. And last night, this guy was like, although it was this totally drunk. So I said, this is the, like the ending scene from Star Wars. You are Chewbacca. I said, actually, you're not Chewbacca. You're too drunk. <laughs> I'm so proud of that. Very well done. The reaction, I'm sure, was very good, right? They like, so the sober Star Wars people. <laughs> Star Wars convention was next door. Star Wars. <laughs> I have a couple dumb uh, Doug questions, if we may. Um, Andy Samberg came to your show for a bachelor party and you created a box. If you watch Saturday Night Live, you know what this box is. Is it in the museum? You know, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> we have to ask Chris and Homer where it went. Okay. What happens is what's interesting is I'm in the audience. I, I know he's there, bachelor party. Right. And then I and he did this dick in a box thing. You know, and I did dick in a box, you do great levitation through that the facility. You know? So we made this illusion. As the show's going on, Homer cutting the stuff and making this it's actually paper with a blue with a blue the alien print on it it's really beautiful he made this thing it was rigged to a levitation arm and and i did this thing and if anybody knew that we're just rushing to get that thing the blue is drying as i'm doing this thing. but that's the links you go to them to get those moments well it's fun so when oprah visited your islands your uh, caribbean islands the islands of david copperfield and Musha Kay, um, she said, David, you have these 10 islands. And you said, 11. 11. It's one louder. It's one louder. Right? What's that from? It's from Spinal Tap, one of my favorite movies. And it's great. Here's my two questions. When you're buying the islands, did that come into consideration? You have to have a Spinal Tap reference. <laughs> okay. There's a second Spinal Tap reference in the islands too. What's that? One of the islands I called, it's the Isle of Lucy. <laughs> of Lucy. That's a line from, you know, the Spinal Tap. It's in there somewhere. Yes, yeah, right, right. One of them, I literally, the Isle of Lucy. Okay. My second question is, when you told her it was 11 and it's one louder, did she get the joke? You know, when you're doing an interview with Oprah, mm. it's, it's, a, you know, 
like thoughts and blah, blah, you know like you're, right. you're thinking lots of stuff right i have no idea how, yeah, right. what her her reaction was do you ever want to speed down you want to call her um <clears throat> did i ask you this no, i asked you this before what's a fun thing you like to do non-magic i like going to movies now we can do that again okay i went to the movie theater what, what did you see recently that you went wow i saw dr strange which is very good yeah um i saw west side story in the theater it's fantastic did you like the original love the original. i think it's the best musical of all time uh, it's my favorite it's up time. it's up there for sure yeah. and robert wise who's collaborating with um jerome jerry robbins who's one of my idols you know mm -hmm. who had many demons jerry robbins look it up it's incredible mm -hmm. but uh level of excellence a lot of that i got that from Jer jerome robbins who collaborated and was fired West Side Story and the shooting. He was a tough, tough one to work with. But his work exists in there. It's amazing. But Spielberg did a very nice job with it. You know, really, really great job. And the originals, you know, I watched the same week I watched On the Island. We got a big screen. I watched the, you know, the classic Robert Wise, J Jerry Robbins one with people that I know. You know, the choreographer, my first special was Jaime Rogers once. The guy that spits in the opening scene. Okay. It's Jaime Rogers, the choreographer. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so, yeah. It was a, uh, I studied studied the, the work of that choreographer a lot. Is there something about Las Vegas you would like to change? Yes, I would like to go back to the time where they had lounges after the shows. Frank Sinatra would finish his performance and he'd walk up the stage and he'd go and he'd watch Shaky Green do an act at one in the morning. There is shows like that, but not many. I think there should be more of those shows. Mm. So there's something for me to do at night. Now it's like everybody goes to bed. You know, but mm. that, that, I would love to be in that time when you could see Buddy Greco. Buddy Greco sing a song. Right. Or you know, I know. Another reference. I, another reference. No, but all of that stuff, you could see those acts play after the show. That would be fantastic. Oh. So you would like to go back in time, you said recently. All the time. Yeah. I think, yeah. Every, everything I do is go and back. And speaking of which, you talk about technology that you, you know, you're on the cutting edge of and you use some technology in your show. Lots of it. Um, do you think time travel is a possibility? I hope so. You know, it's, I think it's very far down the line, but because uh, it's think of the logic of it all. Um, but I think we're achieving so much. You know, Elon Musk is landing that spaceship, you know, the rocket down to for use. It's, it's, you know, and I've seen with technology with my spaceship in the show, actually. You know, things that computers are telling things to balance and do the right thing. So we're, you know, we're on a really interesting path. I imagine what we're doing now. If you get a chance, come to Vegas and see the show. It's just amazing. We haven't even gotten to this museum, but you know, I am just thrilled to be here. How are we on time? Looks good. In 15 minutes? Some questions. Okay, so how about some questions? Um, I'll ask Topher and Greg, if you can maybe monitor that for us. Sure. We, set, we have a couple questions in the chat. Uh, the first okay. one is, if there was a fire for David, if there was a fire in your museum, what one thing would you grab as you ran out? A lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. I think the harness. Problem is, in safe, it would take a lot of time to open up. It's a lot of phases to make the safe. So it's a thumbprint. It's great. It's amazing safe. Um, we have the original orange tree over there. It's amazing. Oh, the blooming orange yeah, yeah. Okay. with the butterflies. <laughs> no, I can't take the water to <laughs> there. Uh, this amazing book. This is with the Lincoln pennies. That's easy to swim in your pocket. Yeah, yeah. You're checking your pockets after. I know. All right. Good question. Next. All right. We have um, in the current Las Vegas show, what effect do you enjoy performing the most? And how do you memorize your script? It takes me a long time to memorize the script. I have it written on the stage, like I talked to you about in the foreign shows, and it finally becomes a part of me. For example, I just got my Twitter account the way I wanted it to be. I used to be D underscore Copperfield. I used to be D, it was just horrible. D underscore, I couldn't believe I had to find underscore Copperfield because I couldn't get Copperfield and I couldn't get it. So finally I was able to acquire uh, at Copperfield. I put that in the show and I talked about it. And as soon as I say at Copperfield, it threw me totally off. I didn't know where I was just because I'm into such a rhythm of this thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had that, now I have a written on stage at Copperfield and a few lines after it. So I can just go to that, get comfortable and be back, get back home again. Um, so it takes me a while to learn new things, 
because uh, I'm not, uh, I do a lot of ad-libbing, but not on those long passages that I do. Now, the favorite thing I to do right now, I think is probably still the half hour of the show with the, with the alien, uh, because it's still things to be learned, things to experiment with timing-wise, uh, and it's really hard. The whole thing was stupid hard to make work, and uh, we got it to work, you know, pretty good. That's very good. Next. All right, so instead of me reading these, I'm gonna ask Noel. Noel, I'm gonna ask you to unmute so that you can read your question. Hi, David. Uh, thanks, thanks for spending your time with us. Um, you talked about giving up the Motley Man illusion. Oh, after is that Noel Britton? Yes. Hi, Noel. Yeah. Hi, Noel. Hi, Doug. Thanks, thanks for organizing this. Um, you, you talked about giving up uh, the Motley Man illusion after a few performances, and yet you also just talked about how you have carried on with the alien and 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 are still tweaking that. What what are the moments when you suddenly go, this isn't working, or what are the elements that you can see in the future where you go, this is worth striving for? I think the, the interesting part was called the it was called make your own magician, uh, and the method was very different, uh, and the, the costume was stupid, but but um, it had no real heart to it. And the alien was worth making work. I knew that if I could do that, I'd be moving things forward a bit, which wasn't true about the, the uh, that illusion with the parts of the bodies and Clint Eastwood and Marilyn Monroe and Gumby. It was, this was, I knew it wasn't worth it. You know, flying was a thing that was worth it because I knew that if I get that right, it would move things forward. The death saw tortured to make it work. Um, getting that to work was worth it. So to go through all the trouble, you know, a spaceship appearing over people's heads, that's worth it, you know? And it was, that's a, that's three versions down to get that to be in the, you notice the TVs in the air, that was, those were part of that illusion. Eventually it was gonna be contained and so I didn't cut and cut, it was a lot of work. Um, so the things I'm working on now that are unique have to be worth doing and then it's worth, worth not throwing away. There's not much that I threw away. Not much, because usually before I start spending time, there's usually a value. I know there's something that I want to, uh, that has a real purpose. It's centered with a core thing that's worth taking the time and, and suffering the suffer that I do. All right. Thank you, Noel. Will, would you like to go next? Yes, uh, David. What's the one aspect of your career that would, if anything drove you to give it up, it would be that? I just I see your life as being so complex in what you do. What's the one thing that drives you nuts? Um, time, not having enough time. Um, not time for to get things done, to get things accomplished. Lack. Huh. Um, you know, I doing a television special every year back in the day. Uh, come up with you know an hour of material. And the stress of that does good things and also does bad things. You have to make sacrifices in the process. We made very few sacrifices during the specials. We, but it really spent a lot of money. I never made money on those specials. I always do it as kind of a promotion thing. I spent millions of dollars on each one of my money beyond what they paid me. Uh, but the time and effort, uh, having a, lot, a limited time does have value. That does create interesting things, the pressure. But also not having tons of time also has a great loop too. In my show now, I'm you know creating things for five years for one little piece, and that's okay. But uh, you know what would I give it up for? If I if the audience wasn't happy, it wasn't you know benefiting, then I probably what's the point of doing it? <coughs> I do so many shows because the audience at least pretend that they're enjoying what I'm doing. So We're sure thank you. Pretending. Thank you, Will. Over. Who do you got? We got Scott. Hi, David. A uh, question. Which living magicians that are around today that when you have a chance to see them perform, give you the same type of awe and wonder that you give to your audiences? Besides Doug, of course. Is that pretty much because there's so many just here in Vegas that um, you can't pick just one or two? I'm trying to get me off. Okay, I appreciate it. I'm trying to get off. Okay. Um, you know, what inspires me in magic is like moments of greatness, moments. Richiardi, 
<laughs> had moments of greatness. As far as speaking and talking, telling jokes, not his best thing. As far as doing close-up magic, not his best thing. When he moved and he did the broom levitation, the broom suspension, or if he did the um, Levent, Sim Kentley, my good friend, sent me a tape of him, Rishi doing a, a square circle. Rishi doing a square circle. And it's just brilliant. Just the, how he shows the, the, the tube and the box empty and just the misdirection. Where he's in. It's great, you know, and it's inspiring. Um, contemporary people, you know, there's some great work out there. There's some fantastic performers. A lot in close-up magic, a lot, brilliant, because they're able to do it. They have the facilities to do all those things. Brilliant. And you've seen them on the AGT shows and, and all that, um, you know. The, the same, I like David Blaine, you know, I think <laughs> some of my colleagues here on the strip that are doing, if they're doing original work, I really enjoy it. I don't get a chance to see them. I'm always performing at the same time. But uh, yeah, a lot of inspiration out there. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. All right, and I think we have Tom next. Uh, Mr. Ambassador Copperfield, is there any special that you would like to redo or do it differently if you had the chance? And I have a follow-up question afterwards. Well, the answer to that is all of them. <laughs> I changed certain haircuts, mm -hmm. their collar sizes. Uh, they're not bad. I pretty much, I did it okay. Most of them are you know, 85%. Do you have a favorite? There's a bunch of, I mean, I like Martin Express. Martin Express is a good show. So the uh, Unexplained Forces, the, the, the Ghost oh, of Spirit the show. Barkley House. Barkley House, yeah. pretty good. You know, uh, you know. Um, is there any of them that really not so much wasn't worth the effort or it's like, why do we do that? Yeah, <laughs> but I think it's, it's mostly because an element is not good. Uh -huh. It was okay. I'm not, I'm sorry. I'm not the show that I terror train. I could have redone that one. Okay. Uh, and secondly, uh, we recently did a thing on uh, a tribute to Doug Henning, and the story came out that there was a, an incident where the two of you were parked in your cars, and either an exchange was done. Do you have a copy of that photo by any stretch of luck? I do. It's a Polaroid. Ah. NBC. They, when Johnny Carson was doing the Tonight Show at that time, they would give me his parking space. And they put the sign of Johnny Carson. They take that and put the sign of David Copperfield. And Doug Henning was next. Next, and you know my, my relationship with Doug was you know was good and then not so good and then good. And uh, now I honor him because he did so much for our art. I think so. I'm, you know, I got all. Thanks for coming. <laughs> no, but I think. Um, thanks uh, for coming. Yeah. What's that? What's thanks for coming? What's that mean? I I thought you were there. Uh, didn't you stop by on Saturday? I didn't. Oh, I okay. So. I apologize. I would like the I like the recording of it though. I'd love to see that. Oh, okay. I did some shows Saturday. Yeah, I I, I understand. Yeah. But uh, there's a lot of good we'll tribute. Recording, yeah. I would love that. There's a lot of good uh, tribute work to him that's happening now, which is great. It's very well deserved. You know, this period of time we had a strained relationship. And, um, you know, but mostly you got to look at the good stuff, right? You look at the good yeah, stuff. yeah. And he did a lot of good stuff for sure. And I thirdly, I want to thank you for your endorsement and help on Hospital Magic. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. See you next week, Tom. Yep. Thank you. Looking forward to it. will be my first Magic Live. All right. How are we in time? What's up? We have two minutes. We have two minutes. All right. Can I jump in and say hello to, to uh, Doug and David? This is Rose Eichenbaum. Hello. I came by and interviewed you for my book that I'm working on. What's the book Still again? I mean, In Pursuit of Insight. I came with my husband. We saw your show, which was amazing. And then you gave us a tour of the museum. And we had a, a wonderful, intimate interview in your, in your plane. Uh, very memorable. <laughs> you do remember me? <laughs> I do, yeah. And it we're was very special. Book, can't wait for the book to come out. Yes. Oh, as soon as uh, that happens, you'll be the first to get a copy, both of you. Thank you. Thank you again for your generosity and your insight. Thank you, Rose. Okay, you're welcome.
All right. Uh, sadly, we have to say goodbye. Um, so I advise all of you to get a plane ticket and fly out here uh, to see David's show. It's an amazing show. And um, David, we can't thank you enough. Um, I've gone over my notes. I'm going to send your resume up to Human Resources, and I think we're going to hire you. So um, here, I'm ready? Yeah. Um, Seriously, thank you so much. You've been kind to us over the years. You haven't visited live, but you've called a couple of times. Um, you even introduced Mary Edid live from the island once when he was lecturing for us. That's right. That's so right. uh, Bill Schmelk uh, arranged that. So we can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you for elevating the art of magic, inspiring us and uh, helping us become better magicians. Yeah, that's a big compliment. Thank you. Well, thank you too.